and I too am going to be sad as, as well. This has become my home away from home. So we originally had uh, the 10 introductory lectures, and for those of you who have paid for the 10, this is your bonus that you're going to get. <laughs> so the title, what, let me go back to the title, uh, Designer Babies Choosing Our Children's Genes. Now, we can already have an influence on the genes of our children, on offspring gen genome. The old school way is just by choosing a mate. And the psychologist Steven Pinker says, anyone who has been turned down for a date has been a victim of the human drive to exert control over half the genes of one's future children. And there's actually been some serious research to show that people tend to be sexually attracted to individuals who have the characteristics they would like to pass on to offspring. The new modern way of having an influence on the genome of one's offspring is uh, by the technique I just described uh, in the last lecture, in vitro fertilization, combined with pre-implantation genetic testing or PGD, where you can take one or two cells out of the extracorporeal embryo, the embryo outside the woman's body, and see if the couples are carriers of genetic disease, you can see if the embryo has been affected, since about in recessive disorders, 50% of them, uh, sorry, 25% uh, uh, will be uh, affected. Discard or use in research the affected ones and only implant the healthy ones. But as we saw in the last hour, uh, IVF is quite burdensome on the woman and is also uh, very expensive. Why might we genetically test uh, embryos? Well, as I just said, the main reason is to prevent the birth of a child with genetic disease. And some of the genetic diseases that are tested for include uh, Tay-Sachs, uh, cystic fibro fibrosis, thalassemia, and sickle cell anemia. They often affect more one population rather than another. African Americans are more likely uh, to be affected by sickle cell anemia. Those in the Mediterranean, Greeks, thalassemia, cystic fibrosis, more often uh, those who are Celts in origin, and uh, Tay-Sachs, more often Ashkenazi Jewish population, although it's also uh, been found in Cajun populations as well. There is a non-disease use for um, PGD, and that is you can test to see if the embryo will result in a boy or a girl determine sex. And here again, there could be a medical or a non-medical reason for it. Uh, if you have in your family a disease like hemophilia, which is almost entirely males, uh, the family might wish to have a girl to avoid the transmission of hemophilia. Non-medical reason would simply be a preference. Um, in um, sexist cultures, the preface might be for a boy. Uh, in non-sexist cultures, it might be for what's been called family balancing. You know, we already have a boy, we'd like a girl. We already have a girl, we'd like a boy. In the future, there might be other uses for genetic testing and embryo discard uh, for non-disease traits. And so in 2009, a fertility doctor in Los Angeles, Dr. Jeffrey Steinberg, claimed that he could give parents an 80% chance of getting the desired hair or eye color by looking at the embryos, which were created for fertility purposes, and then discarding the ones that were not the desired hair color or eye color. Uh, shortly after he did that, many infertility doctors said that he was, um, it was nonsense and he couldn't do it and he had to kind of take it back, and we, we really haven't heard from Jeffrey Steinberg since then. 
So one question is, is it really possible to do something uh, like this? It's only an 80% chance, by the way, so some people might think, you know, if you're, it would only be attractive at all to people who are already undergoing IVF because they are infertile. You certainly wouldn't want to give up having babies the old-fashioned way just for an 80% chance of getting blue or green or brown eyes. So, but if it were possible, would it be ethical? You couldn't do it, by the way, say, if you were two Indian parents with brown eyes, because you, you have to have some blue eyes or green eyes in the background in order to get the possibility. Gene therapy is using uh, modification of uh, genes to cure or prevent disease. Uh, and it's been around for a long time now. It's had a few successes. It's also had many failures. And one of the reasons it's had failures is just all medicine is hard. You know, whether you're doing chemo, whether you're giving drugs, it doesn't always work, right? You don't know why. There's a certain statistical or probabil probabilistic element in medicine. And gene therapy, like any other medical intervention, has all of those problems, and it poses special challenges as well. So what are some of those challenges? Well, first of all, there are relatively few genetic diseases that are caused by just one gene, a defect in one gene. Huntington's is the usual example of a single gene disease. But most genetic diseases, whether it's Tay-Sachs or cystic fibrosis or thalassemia, are caused by a number of genes all interacting with each other. And when you talk about diseases like a propensity to get breast cancer or colon cancer or heart disease, all of which we know have a, an inheritance uh, aspect to them, it gets even more complicated than that, the number of genes that will be involved. And because they're all acting, interacting with one another, you can't just identify the, all of the genes, which might be 500, say, but you have to see how they interact with one another. And then, all of them interact with the environment. And what I mean by that is, uh, a child may carry genes that would predispose the child for schizophrenia, say, but not get schizophrenia. And it might, the, what has to happen is that the genes have to be turned on in order to be uh, effective for transmitting schizophrenia. And this switching on of genes is called epigenetics and is affected by all kinds of things in the environment, the uterine environment, the, uh, where the child lives and what uh, chemicals the child is exposed to, diet, many, many, many things like this. So all of that is really difficult, and we are not um, helped by the media talking about scientists have discovered the gene for schizophrenia. It doesn't exist. There is no such thing. The gene for homosexuality doesn't exist, even if there is a genetic basis for a trait. The next real challenge is, in order to do gene editing, to either splice out the defective uh, gene or splice in the healthy one, you have to target exactly the right location on the gene. And that's really hard to do. That takes a lot of skill. Um, so then we've got the whole thing of epigenetics and how genes interact with one another. Just Going back to the schizophrenia example, there's some evidence now that if a, a woman is exposed to certain viruses during her pregnancy, that might trigger the gene for schizophrenia. But if she isn't exposed to it, the child may never develop schizophrenia. And even if you have identical twins who have the same genome, if one develops schizophrenia, the risk that the identical twin will also develop it, 50%. Only 50%. So this is to make you understand that while genes are important in the traits we have, they're hardly the whole story. And then finally, one of the challenges of gene therapy is to avoid unforeseen and unwanted side effects. 
And I'll just give you one little story about scientists who were, this was with mice, the scientists were trying to create an albino mouse. And they tweaked the gene that would do that, and they did get an albino mouse, but his uh, digestive system was upside down and backwards inside. So they had no idea that tweaking the genes for coloration would have this effect on his digestive system. So anytime you're going to do something, you have to be very, very careful. Now, you may have read about in the news a promising new gene editing technology called CRISPR, uh, Cas9. The Cas9 refers to a particular protein, which is a new and promising way to do gene editing. And what's kind of cool about it is that it makes use of a technique that is already in nature. It's not something that scientists have invented. It was something that they uh, discovered. They found that this was something that was already being done to um, get rid of harmful things in some old school kind of uh, molecules. And it has already been used to modify mosquitoes to prevent the transmission of malaria. It does two things. It prevents the mosquitoes from transmitting malaria, and it also makes the females uh, sterile so that they won't reproduce and that these modified mosquitoes would take over a population. This is all in the laboratory. It still has to be tested to make sure that nothing else terrible is going to happen, no environmental unforeseen effects, and the release of these mosquitoes into the wild is at least a decade away. But that would be something that would be very good, because right now, how do you get rid of mosquitoes? You have to kill them using insecticides, right? Uh, old school insecticide was DDT, and that was very harmful to the, to the environment. So this might be a, a, a much better way, a less environmentally damaging way to reduce malaria, which is such a terrible scourge in so many uh, countries. There's a uh, company called Editas that hopes to uh, use the CRISPR technique in a clinical trial, they hope to do it by 2017, to treat a rare form of blindness called labor congenital amaurosis. And this would be a very good case for gene editing because the exact gene error for this rare form of blindness is known and the eye is easy to reach. So if they were able to do this, it wouldn't have a big impact on the population because it's so rare. But it would teach us an awful lot about gene editing to cure or prevent disease. Of course, we, we don't know if it will work. And again, there could be unintended side effects that would be worse than, than the blindness. So again, fraught with danger, but very promising also. So the biggest problems that in genetic modification are uh, safety and efficacy. But if you could take care of the problems of safety and efficacy, I don't think many people would have a problem with gene therapy. Uh, it's like any other kind of medicine intended to cure or prevent disease. What, where people really get upset is when we move from therapy to enhancement. And what is enhancement? Well, it's the idea that you would be trying to pick, choose traits that are not disease traits. We're not trying to get people back to normal or well, but we're trying to enhance people, that is, make them better than well. So how should we define uh, enhancement? And this is a, a huge problem, which my, my colleague, uh, Mike Campbell, has been working on. Uh, there are many problems. I'll just mention a few. One a fairly simple one is that the line between therapy and enhancement is, is not always clear. For example, some means of preventing disease, which would seem to be on the therapy side, such as vaccination, work by enhancement. That is, they enhance the immune system. Yet, because it prevents disease, we're happy to call vaccination a kind of, a kind of therapy. Another problem is, where is normal? What counts as normal? 
What's the baseline for normal? And that becomes an issue because with certain kinds of disorders, uh, people who have them say, I don't see it as uh, an illness. We see this with the deaf community, which says we have our own culture, we have our own language, and we don't want to be cured, thank you very much. You see this with uh, people who are high functioning on the autism spectrum who say, we have a different way of learning and perceiving the world, but we're not sick and we don't need to be cured. So that's another whole issue. Then what kind of improvements uh, count as enhancement? Not, not all of them do. Uh, most people would say that if you undergo a, a training regimen intended to make you strong or a special diet which is supposed to improve your performance as an athlete, well, that's not really enhancement. That's something else. And so it's not always easy to say what things are enhancements and why they are enhancements. And so I'm just going to leave that naughty philosophical question at this point and, and take a line from a Supreme Court Justice who was talking about pornography, same problem, and he said, I don't know how to define it, but I know it when I see it. So I think we do know it when we see it, even if we can't define it, so I'll give you some examples. So what kinds of enhancements might there be? Some enhancements are for appearance, and remember, enhancement is not making people healthy, it's just making them better than well. So cosmetic surgery would seem to be a clear kind of um, uh, enhancement. Um, you know, a nose job or a tummy tuck or perhaps breast enlargements, all of those are cosmetic. There can be plastic surgery which makes people actually um, uh, look normal and we wouldn't think of that as enhancement. But these kinds of things are not are there to make you prettier. Similarly, you might have medication, for example. There's uh, a drug now that men can take to uh, treat certain kinds of male pattern baldness, not, not all kinds. And uh, that's also uh, enhancement. Or there may be enhancements for mental or physical performance. Uh, there are legal drugs that people are prescribed for certain kinds of conditions, but then they become used off-label for enhancement. So Ritalin, which is used uh, sometimes to treat children with ADHD, can be taken by college students uh, to help them study for exams or stay awake. By the way, coffee, I suppose, is a kind of enhancement too. It keeps you awake. Uh, athletes, steroids are well used in, in medical treatment for many, many kinds of conditions, but athletes have taken them to bulk up and make them uh, stronger. And then, of course, there are illegal drugs as well, like speed, which might help with concentration and uh, um, staying awake and things like that. Society is often willing to tolerate the use of some enhancements, such as cosmetic surgery, and it may impose some controls on these. It's virtually never willing to uh, pay for them. So sometimes a way to define enhancement is, will someone pay for you to get it? If, if it will, it's not an enhancement. And what is genetic enhancement then? Well, very simply, it's using genetic means to avoid, get or devo uh, avoid non-disease traits. And again, this might be done through genetic testing of embryos and discard of embryos that don't have the trait you want. But it might also be done by actually modification of embryos, perhaps by CRISPR or some other gene editing technique. And that's where we get the expression designer babies. Now this is a very misleading expression, as I, I hope you will agree by the end of this talk because it gives the impression that we could say, oh, I want a child who is um, good at basketball and good at foreign languages, but doesn't like mysteries, but, you know, well, that's never gonna happen. You, you know, it's just such a misnomer. And I hope by the end of this talk, you'll see why. But there, first question, could there be such a thing as genetic enhancement? Can it be done? And should it be done? 
would it be ethical to do it? There are technical difficulties of genetic enhancement. It's important to understand. First, all of the difficulties that I said exist in gene therapy exist in genetic enhancement, and then some, right? First of all, even if there are a few single gene diseases like Huntington's, there are no single gene non-disease traits. There's no gene for intelligence. There's no gene for homosexuality. None of these things that you might want to either choose for or against are a matter of one gene. And then here's a really interesting question. We, we do know that intelligence has a genetic basis. Smart people tend to have smart children. Not always. Sometimes smart people have a real dummy for a kid, and vice versa. Sometimes two people who seem really stupid have a genius child. So it's not perfect. But in general, there seems to be a, a genetics obviously plays a role. Now, what if you were able to figure out all of the genes that play a role in intelligence and all of the ways they interact and all of the ways in which the environment triggers them on or off and you were able to modify the embryo and then the child gets born and you have to wait a while, right? Because newborns are kind of stupid, right? And, so, and now the child is 10 and you say, did it work? How do you know? Because you'd have to ask the question, is this child smarter than he would have been if not modified? How can you possibly answer that question? It's a real uh, difficulty, I think, in sort of philosophy of, of science. So these are all technical difficulties. There are a lot of misconceptions about what genetic enhancement would be, quite independent of the tef technical difficulties. And one misconception is to think that if you genetically enhanced a child, that child would automatically be brainy, athletic, musical. And that's just not the case. What you have to think about is natural genetic advantages. So if you have two people who are terrific athletes and they marry, like Andre Agassi and Steffi Graf got married, and they have a child, that child is probably going to be pretty athletic and pretty coordinated. And being raised by them is probably has a good advantage toward becoming a really good tennis player. But if, if, if little Andre Jr. stays in his room playing video games all the time, he's not going to be a very good tennis player, right? And similarly, if two very brainy people have a kid who just doesn't want to read and doesn't want to you know, study, that kid is not going to be a, a, you know, a very smart, uh, smart person. So what we're talking about is not a magic pill that will, you, know, you give it to the kid and all of a sudden they're you know, doing quadratic equations. At the best, it might give an enhanced child what the child of two brainy people would have naturally, namely what I call a genetic edge. You know, Just like that little Andre Jr. has a genetic edge for being an athlete. And if we don't understand this, if we don't understand how the science works, we're never going to be able to talk sensibly about the ethics of genetic modification. Because people are going to just be thinking it's a magic pill, and then they're going, whoa, we don't want to do that. It's not like that. And what's the risk of not understanding it? Well, people might then say, we have to ban this. It's too dangerous. It's too scary. It's, it's going to be Hitler and clones all over again. And you could have the risk of an unjustified banning, which might actually deprive human beings of something that would be very valuable, like GMO foods. I don't know what the situation here in Hong Kong is, but in Europe, people are going, oh, I don't want any GMO modified foods. You know, We don't want any modified foods. All your food is modified. Let me tell you that. It's just taken longer. Right? So I'm not saying that there aren't risks to things that Monsanto has done, risks to the environment, problems with fairness and farmers being able to buy seeds. There's lots of problems. But let's not say, oh, it's genetically modified. I only eat organic food. Yeah. 
So here's a list of the arguments I'm going to consider and um, pretty much uh, either reject or say that the concern has to be modified before we can take it seriously. And there's a whole lot more that I'm not even going to bring up because I don't think they're as interesting, but they can come up in the discussion because I'm sure you'll think of them. Uh, the first is the argument against design. This is kind of an in-joke for philosophers who talk about the proof of the existence of God, the argument from design. So this is the argument against design. Philosophers in the audience could go, ha, ha, ha. Right. Uh, argument from genetic determinism, argument from autonomy, argument from identity, argument from authenticity, argument from giftedness slash parental tyranny, and argument from social justice. So the argument against design goes something like this. It's wrong for parents to want to des design their children. They shouldn't do that. Parents should accept their children for who they are, not try to design them. Now, we have to look at this a little bit more carefully. The argument can't be that parents should never try to influence the traits their children have. I mean, that's a parent's job. Imagine a parent who said, I don't care if my children are wild, rude hooligans. I just love them for who they are. No. We want them to be intellectually curious. And we want them to be friendly but not gullible. We want them to be kind and not cruel. I mean, we could probably come up with a, a fairly a uh, long list of, of traits we hope our children will have and won't have. And there'll be some disagreements, but there'll be a lot of agreement uh, as well. So maybe the argument against design is not the argument, which I think is very implausible, that parents should never attempt to influence what their children are like. And remember, there are no designer babies. The most you could do is give them a genetic edge but rather that there's something wrong with the attempt to shape our children by genetic means. And so the argument would go something like, well, of course we want to shape our children through example, through education, through discipline. We, we do all of those things, but not genetic shaping of our children. And I think the, this rests on a misconception the misconception that genes are deterministic in a way that other factors in shaping children are not. So that brings me to the next argument, the argument from genetic determinism. And I think it's a fallacy. The fallacy of genetic determinism just is the view that genes are different. Genes are more deterministic than other means of shaping children. But they are not. Everything we do to and about our children shapes them. The food we give them, the environment we raise them in. And it's not just that somehow the body is left alone and, and their minds or souls, if you have a kind of dualistic view, get changed. Education actually changes the brain. The connections, the synapses get changed by education. So a good friend and a co colleague in bioethics, the physician Alex Moran in Switzerland, calls education rather slyly neuronal phenotype manipulation. <laughs> right. And by the way, education is pretty permanent. Right. Once you learn to ride a bike, you never forget. Once you learn a language, you, you pretty much remember it. It can be more or less permanent, but it's not genetic, it's education. So many environmental influences, uh, diet I've already mentioned. There's been a study that recently came out about child abuse and how that permanently changes the child's brain. Now, when I say permanent, I don't mean can never be changed because People can sometimes overcome things that happen to them. Children who are born to uh, uh, drug users can, through therapy and um, uh, the right kinds of treatment, can overcome that, for example. So it may be that children who have been abused as child have a tendency to move in a certain way. Maybe it can be corrected, but maybe not. So many, many things change us. To think that genes are different is to commit the fallacy of genetic 
determinism. The next argument is called the argument from autonomy, and it goes like this. Well, when parents select genes for their child, trying to get certain kinds of traits that they value, they're infringing the child's autonomy. They're forcing the child to be a particular kind of person, the kind of person the parents want. So if the parents want an athlete, they might try to enhance the child's athletic ability. If they want a brainy child, they might try to enhance the child's intellect. But that isn't maybe not be what the child wants. Maybe the child doesn't want to be an athlete. You know, we have a lot of uh, parents who get their kids out there, force them to play sports. Maybe that's not what the child wants. This would be that to the nth degree. But I think the argument doesn't make any sense, and here's why because it assumes that when gene selection, sorry, gene inheritance, I should say, is natural, that is, we're all born with a set of genes, we were able to make choices. Of course, that's ridiculous. No one gets to choose his or her own genes, right? We just play the hand we're, we're dealt. So it's not clear to me at all that it infringes your child's autonomy. Now. We'll get back to other things that parents might do, but it's not an infringement of autonomy because that would assume that it would contrast with natural gene inheritance, and your autonomy is not involved there either. Uh, the next slide uh, is uh, thanks to uh, Jonathan Chan from when I gave this uh, talk at uh, Hong Kong Baptist University, and he asked me a question about uh, what about changing identity? And his actual question was, what if parents changed every gene in their child to get a perfect set of genes? Wouldn't that be changing the child's identity, and, and would that be uh, ethical? Well, actually, you can't change every gene. I've talked to uh, Shekhar about this. Uh, you know, even changing one can have so many effects. You try to change all of them, you're just going to destroy it. That's all. You're not going to get a new child. You're just going to destroy it. But there's another version of this argument that I think uh, has to be taken seriously, which is, well, if you modify the genes of offspring enough, might you be actually changing who gets born? You'd be changing the, the genome sufficiently that it would be different. And some people might say, do parents really have a right to do this? Now, to answer this, this objection, I have to make a distinction between two senses of the word identity. Sometimes when we talk about identity, we're talking about numerical identity, just what makes me the same person over time, right? I'm Bonnie Steinbach. I was born in New York in 1947, et cetera. Sometimes when we're talking about identity, we're talking about my life story, you know, who I am and what I'm like. And if, for example, I were to be um, converted to uh, fundamental Christianity tomorrow and, and become a supporter of Donald Trump, I would be unrecognizable as the person I am. I'd still be my, me in the sense of numerical identity, right? But somebody might say, I don't know what happened to her. She must have been brainwashed or, you know, went crazy or is getting demented or something like that. Now, in this question about changing the child's genome, I don't think we can be talking about changing the child's narrative identity. Certainly, embryos don't even have a narrative identity. And, and if you were talking about a born child who is old enough to have a narrative identity, you really can't do much more with somatic cell interventions than change one gene. It's just, it's, it, the, the problem with somatic cells is they're not proliferating. If you want to make real changes in the genome, you have to do it at a very early stage when you have cells that are still proliferating. Could you change the child's numerical identity by an intervention at the embryonic stage? Maybe. But I don't see why that would be problematic ethically, and here's why. Look, which embryo is created is a real matter of problem, you know, luck. Which sperm gets together with the egg that happens to have been released? And if one sperm swims a little faster, you'll get a different component of the male genes, and you'll get an entirely different child. 
They will be as different as siblings are, for example. So if at the embryonic stage we have no idea which embryo is going to exist, what difference would it make if you change the identity of the embryo? I don't see how it could. So changing numerical identity at the embryonic stage doesn't seem to me problematic, and you can't do it beyond the embryonic stage. So either identity in the morally important sense, namely numerical, is not, can't be changed, or it's not wrongful. So I dismiss that argument. Argument from authenticity, and um, this I got from a television uh, program uh, that was in, on in the States very briefly in uh, the uh, 2000, and then they took it off again. And it was about this whole group of people who had been genetically modified. And the argument from authenticity says something like this, personalities of genetically modified people would be less real or less authentic than the personalities of the rest of us. So one of the characters in the show says to one of her friends, I sometimes wonder if I'm really cheerful or if I've just been genetically modified to be cheerful. Well, that might seem to make a little bit of sense unless you think about it for about two minutes because <laughs> what you would be doing if you genetically modified her to be cheerful, assuming this is possible, is to just make her cheerful the same way she would be if she had inherited those genes from her parents, right? The trait would be as authentic as, how, it doesn't matter how you got it. So let me give you an example, I think, which will make this very clear. They did a study not too long ago, and they found that individuals who had one or especially two copies of the short allele of a particular gene called the 5-HTT gene, were more susceptible to getting depressed after stressful events. Whereas on the other hand, people who inherited uh, the two copies of the long allele of that gene were more resilient, less likely to become depressed after stressful events. Now, would it make any sense to say, am I really resistant to depression or have I only been genetically modified? No. I mean, if you were lucky enough to get the long version, the long allele from, from your parents, you'd be less likely to be depressed. And if you unfortunately got the short allele and we were able to give you the long allele, that would make you less likely to be depressed. How you got the gene would have no effect whatsoever on the reality or authenticity of the trait. It's only if you have sort of this idea, no, but the, the, the genes you had in the beginning, those are really you. And I don't, don't understand why anybody would uh, think that. Now we get to more serious uh, arguments. The argument from giftedness is one that comes from the philosopher uh, Michael uh, Sandel, and it's a twist on the argument uh, against design. It's not saying that parents should never attempt to influence the traits their, their children have. But rather, Sandel wants to resist what he calls the Promethean urge, the urge to control too much. And so what he says is we're seeing an explosion of hyper-parenting, where parents feel they have to control everything where the kids go to school and whether they, you know, play sports so that they'll get into the right college. And, and they just won't let their children be. They won't let them develop and find their own path, make their own mistakes. Now, I know none of you are hyper parents in here, right? Those of you who are parents. Uh, we certainly are not, but those terrible hyper parents, right? <laughs> And Tom Murray makes a similar kind of argument. Uh, he talks about parental ty tyranny, uh, where you're just not willing to accept your child for what their talents and their uh, interests are. And he thinks that's, that's terrible. Let children find their own ways of, of uh, flourishing. And I certainly agree. But these are not objections to genetic enhancement, per se. They're objections to certain styles of parenting. And if it's the style of parenting that we object to, let's talk about that. Let's talk about 
parental tyranny. Let's talk about hyperparenting. Let's talk about helicopter parents who seem to think that they are supposed to be doing the child's homework in college. Now, what people who uh, bring up this argument will say is, yes, yes, of course. But why should we add a technology that might exacerbate uh, hyperparenting or exacerbate um, parental tyranny? And so we have to ask ourselves, well, would the existence of this technology uh, do it? And I think it depends partly on what traits are being chosen and the motives for, for choosing them. If you're trying to make your child into a, a great ballerina or a great basketball player uh, without any concern for what the child might want to do, that would be a pretty terrible thing. But if, for example, you had been terribly shy and so was your spouse and it made it really difficult for you to have relations with people, you might want to give your child a genetic edge against crippling uh, shyness. And that, it seems to me, would not necessarily be hyperparenting. It would be kind of a reasonable thing to do. Of course, also, um, would it exacerbate bad parenting? Well, let's think about uh, uh, what you would have to do in order to have this kind of enhancement, a point I'll get back to at the very end. Another serious argument is the argument from social justice. Um, and I explain it this way, genetic interventions will likely be very expensive and therefore open primarily to the rich. And this will exacerbate the already terrible inequality in society that we have. And it will perpetuate advantages to those who are uh, wealthy. Um, well, here's what I think. I've given you lots of reasons to think you couldn't do it very successfully. But if you could do it, it seems to me that genetic enhancement would be a drop in the bucket compared to current sources of inequality. So if you're really serious about combating, combating inequality, the method is not to ban certain technologies. It's to look at housing and schooling and tutoring and in the United States, white privilege, and try to combat those kinds of things. If you're not doing that, I'm not taking your concerns about social justice all that seriously. There's another point which Alan Buchanan has made in um, uh, Beyond Humanity, which is, you know, if we did learn how to give a genetic edge, we could use it as society. We could choose to use it to those kids who are genetically disadvantaged. We could pay for it. In other words, how we use the technology is up to us. We could allow certain people to get all the advantages, or we could try to level the playing field by making sure that everyone has those sorts of advantages. We shouldn't be too tempted by the hot and sexy. I'm borrowing this line from my colleague, Shekhar Kamta. You know, bioethicists often get sucked in by the hot and the sexy. A few years ago, it was cloning. Now it's gene editing. We also talk about head transplants. And I'm as guilty as uh, anyone else uh, for this. And the media, of course, exacerbates it. You know, suppose we say, Bad schools, in, you know, exacerbate inequality. Newsflash! <laughs> Reporters all go, yeah, that's not exactly news. We don't, we don't. Why do we want to write about that, right? But I do think that bioethicists have an obligation to say something about the real issues in uh, social justice. And I've, I'm sorry that Professor Kumta couldn't be here for this talk. These are all from him. He said he's more worried about Coca-Cola using up the water supply in poor countries and diverting essential water to factories and then selling discounted water to the population. He's more concerned about drug factories in India and China that provide 92% of the world's illicit drugs. He's more worried about the farmer suicides in India, which did not have anything to do with genetically modified foods. It had to do with greed, bad planning, and corruption. So I think we all have to remind ourselves that as much fun as this other stuff is, there are real issues facing us, and 
bioethicists have as much obligation as anyone else to remind us of what these issues are. But, and then now I'm coming to my conclusion, the first part, I don't think uh, it's completely irresponsible to talk about gene editing or genetic enhancement, as I've been doing today, because I think that bioethicists also have an obligation to help educate the public so that we're not misled and that we don't fall um, prey to genetic determinism and bad arguments as well. It's important as philosophers, particularly, to expose bad arguments and expose misunderstanding of science so that people really know what we're talking about. And then we can get serious about whether something should or should not be allowed. And I agree that some of the objections I've mentioned, the ones that have to do with parenting styles and social justice, are very serious objections. But I would ask that people not, somebody gave me this line once when I gave this talk, don't fetishize the technology. If the issue is parenting and the kind of parents we think people should be, let's talk about that. If the issue is social justice, Let's talk about that seriously. Um, genetic interventions, genetic uh, modifications could be beneficial. It's up to us how we use the technology. And the second part of my conclusion, look, I'm no transhumanist. I'm no enthusiast for genetic enhancement. I think there are plenty of reasons to be skeptical of genetic interventions, whether they're therapeutic or uh, a means of enhancement. And the biggest one is safety and efficacy, particularly when you're talking about modifying the germline, because then those traits will be inheritable. And what could happen is that you would get a very nasty, unforeseen side effect several generations down the line, and it might be too late to reverse it. That's a real serious issue that we have to consider. But finally, getting back to the real world now, imagine uh, a couple and they go, we hear you've got this great new technology, I can genetically enhance my kid. Why would you use your resources on an expensive technology that might conceivably give your child a genetic edge instead of using your research on what we know works, you know? Talk to the infants, read to your children, improve the schools, send them to summer camp, have them learn a musical instrument. These are things that enhance uh, intelligence, get them to play sports to make sure their bodies are strong. I really can't imagine anybody saying, Let's give up sexual intercourse. Let's go through IVF, and maybe we might. Of course, we'll never know if the child was enhanced because of the problem of not knowing what he would have been had you not enhanced him. It just seems to me kind of, uh, in the last analysis, pretty silly. Thank you. Hi, uh, great talk again. Um, my question is, uh, when you look at sort of restraints on applications of uh, gene editing uh, or genetic uh, enhancement, are you talking about, do you, think, do you think primarily normative or regulatory restraint, restraints are called for? Uh, let's imagine the case of, of parents who, um, let's see, opt for the genetic uh, opt for the genetic techno uh, some form of gene editing, some form of, you know, they want their kid's skin to be uh, dark or pale or eyes blue or black, musical, talent, etc. cetera. Uh, then go and, uh, uh, you know, buy the eggs and sperm to do that. And uh, the, the surrogate parent to, uh, surrogate mother to go through the gestation. Uh, and perhaps their map is also one that we might, that their template for the child, the desired template, is also one we might consider kind of repugnant, like, uh, you know, some exaggeration or caricature of the normal human being, a superwoman or a superman. Now, does that require a, a, a set of social, a social consensus or a set of 
social understandings, or is there some point where you would you think regulatory restraint would be in order? So I think we give parents an awful lot of leeway in how they bring up their children, and I think that's probably the best way to do it with a certain amount of social pressure not to do certain sorts of things. So 50 years ago, kids were routinely smacked if they misbehaved. You do that in a supermarket now, at least in the US, and you will get very, you know, shocked stares. We don't, I mean, in Sweden, it's actually illegal to hit your kids. It's not illegal in the US unless you hit them so badly that it, it counts as, as child abuse, but it is not socially acceptable any more than smoking, for example, is. So the question you raise, when do, would we want to have regulation, I think, would depend on the likelihood of being able to do things. I mean, if you want to get a child with blue eyes and you're willing to get a sperm donor with blue eyes and an egg donor with blue eyes, you can do that. And it, it's very possible to do that. Uh, you can't guarantee the kid would have brown, uh, blue eyes because that's how inheritance works. Sometimes the kid might have green eyes or even brown eyes. But you might improve your, your chances of that, and that seems so harmless as to, and I can't imagine, regulatory. Uh, Superman, well, um, what I've been trying to argue is that's not a realistic kind of scenario ever, but there might be some kinds of enhancements for increasing muscle strength, for example, but whether that would be something that would be disadvantageous to the child would depend on what other things came along with, with it. And certainly I would think the first thing we would want to make sure is that the medical profession who are helping people with infertility, right, would have their own standards of what, what makes sense. There are plenty of, it's, it's not illegal to do sex selection in the United States, but you're not going to get most fertility clinics to help you with that. I'm just not going to do it, they say. I've got a healthy baby, I'm not going to do it. So. Hi. Um, Bonnie, thanks again for this fascinating lecture. I have two questions. The first one is um, when you mentioned about enforcing consequence in the, in the conclusion, that's not actually in your list of objections, possible objections against genetic enhancement. Goes so, under safety. Go, oh, I see. Okay. So yeah. would you? My first question is therefore, would you think therefore think that uh, you know this might be, you know, as a matter of empirical or contingent fact, might might that be a real concern uh, given? Absolutely. And as a matter of fact, years ago, I was on a working group that was talking about uh, genetic modification of the germline to prevent disease, serious serious genetic disease. And the problem was, given that you might affect the germline and that the child might reproduce and it might show up uh, generations down the line, the question was, well, why would you ever do it? Well, because another way to prevent genetic disease is by discard of embryos. So absolutely you have to think of what is the need for this intervention? What are the risks we would be taking? And does the need for it balance the risks? to the best of our knowledge, which is really, really hard to do. But yeah, I think it's, it's A number one. The reason why I didn't focus on it so much is, of course, safety and efficacy. At any time you bring in a, 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 a new medicine, a new drug, a new technique, that's the first thing we want to find out. What are, are there going to be the uh, problems? And with uh, modifying the germline, uh, unexpected side effects down the line are, are very big concern. Okay, thank you. Um, and that question I have is uh, about the, which, which we have talked discussed before about the social justice one. I'm just wondering, um, your, your reply to someone who's, who's maybe having a problem with, with this, with uh, gene enhancement from social justice point of view, is that first of all, it might not be that helpful, and secondly, uh, you know, given the the range of injustice we have, you know, this is only a bucket. I'm I'm just wondering. Suppose thirty years later, it's really helpful. It's much more helpful than tutoring, private school, and so on. And I'm just wondering, what would you say now? What 
one reply you might have is private school. And, and I think someone might want to say private school is, is okay, given that public school is reasonably good. But that if the public school is really terrible, then the existence of private school, or rather the education system itself might be still objectionable. So, right. so someone may want to say that, you know, sometimes people say that life is unfair. So <laughs> why talk about fairness? But then I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, to what extent one can Right. Well, I actually had a three-pronged answer, and the, you, you mentioned the first two. The first was, I, I think we should not forget how difficult it will be to do in any meaningful way. The second one is that um, uh, it, it's a drop in the bucket compared to the other causes of uh, social injustice. But the third one was, if we did find something that was really effective and better than tutoring, why couldn't we give it to the children who lack the genetic edge because their parents aren't very smart or very healthy or you know very strong in order to bring them up? I mean, I think one of the mistakes we make is to look at um, an environment the way it is and just assume, well, that can't be changed. It isn't even when we think it can't be changed. We just don't see it. We're blinkered. And in this respect, it reminds me of the talk that uh, Paul gave about uh, the children in uh, Willowbrook who were um, given a mild form of hepatitis in order to, to test a therapy. And it was thought, well, it's not really hurting them. They're all going to get hepatitis anyway. This place is so filthy. You know, it's, it, hepatitis is rampant. And no one said, how about you clean it up so the kids don't get hepatitis? So I'm making a similar point here, which is if we found something and it really was effective, more effective perhaps than the other interventions that we have, and we're really concerned about social justice, then we might say, now we've got to use our tax dollars to make sure that the disadvantaged kids get it as well. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Sandberg, for the rich and stimulating lecture. And I have the privilege to hear your talk uh, twice. And my question... Are you um, convinced yet? <laughs> well, Set, I, throw it again! <laughs> I have some, uh, well, same questions about uh, uh, the argument from identity. You, you're dismissing the argument uh, partially based on, uh, which is partially based on the claim, a factual claim that it is impossible to right. uh, completely change a person's genome within a period? Well, uh, my question is, is a question of clarification. Uh, what kind of impossibility is it? It's uh, a factual, it I mean. Technologically uh, Yeah, I'm, I am not a scientist, so, and, and Shekhar has run out on me because he would be able to explain it better. But what he said was, any time you change a gene, it has all kinds of effects that you know you you may not even uh, known about. And the more you change, it's kind of like I think maybe the model. This is not him. This is me talking now. So, well, what if I just go in my computer and I just tweak a few things? It's not that you're going to get a different computer. It's that you're going to get a mess. Or maybe with a car, you know, can I just tweak, 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 tweak? Because things work all together. So the most you could hope for if you were going to not do the germline, which is uh, modifying embryos, basically, but doing a somatic cell, like with the blindness here, you could change one gene, and then the person hopefully would be able to see. But you wouldn't be able with once the, the embryo had differentiated and become, you know, like a fetus with, with a kidney and skin and all the different cells, you wouldn't be able to modify it. You could do a lot more modification at the embryonic stage. Not completely, but maybe enough so we would say, gee, is it really the same individual because the genome it had here looks different from the genome it has here. And I think that is possible, but I don't see why it would be wrong. It's not like 
me making you into a completely different individual. It would be just, now you have this embryo rather than that embryo, which could have happened if a different embryo, a different sperm swam faster and fertilized the egg. Well, what, I, what I'm thinking is about uh, this scenario, uh, to change one gene in a, within a period and change another gene in another period and within a certain period, like five years, could I? Uh, no, because once you get differentiation, you, can, you, you no longer have the proliferation of cells that would enable you to ch actually change the genome. You might be able to change one gene to cure blindness or to cure deafness. That they're working on, but you wouldn't be able to do it over a period of five years. You have a window of opportunity while cells are undifferentiated at the embryonic stage. You could do that, but not once they become differentiated. Then you could only maybe change one gene, maybe two. Yes, I, I understand what you're saying. My, my question is whether it is only uh, technologically impossible now, or it is in principle uh, from the... As I understand the science, it is in principle scientifically <laughs> impossible because of the way things work. It's not logically impossible, but as a matter of fact, you couldn't, you couldn't do it. So, right. Hi. Um, I'd just like to ask a question because um, I hear a lot about we, we, whether we decide what is right or wrong. I'm just curious the mechanism that results in a regulatory framework w regarding these technologies and given that governments, departments work so well together and react very quickly, I'm just <laughs> wondering how the decision is made since these discoveries and technology exists across the spectrum, academia, corporates, corporations, etc., how does the final decision or an eventual decision about technology get made that results in a law, given that in the states you have a federal law and you have state laws? Yeah, well, I can only speak from the American perspective and not as knowledgeably as I would like, but one organization that's very um, powerful is the Food and Drug Administration. So, for example, when the question came about modifying mitochondrial DNA, could you do that? The, that went to the FDA. Now, what goes to the FDA and what doesn't go to the FDA is actually fascinating in itself because sometimes they just say, yeah, that's under our jurisdiction. Okay. <laughs> and sometimes they go, no, uh, food supplements, not under our jurisdiction. I don't understand exactly why. They have a, an ability to do regulatory things that don't require any laws to be passed. And sometimes laws get passed which are just um, absurd. So when the stem cell stuff came out, all kinds of states passed laws about that that you know, didn't cohere with the science and didn't make any sense. And one of the things that's happened, which is really unfortunate, is because of the abortion wars, you have no federal funds may be used for any research that harms or kills embryos in the United States. It doesn't mean the research can't be done. It does mean, though, that the US government can't fund it, which means that, in practice, sometimes, the research can't be done. And what that's meant is that American uh, infertility experts are trying to operate with their hands tied behind their backs, and they could figure out ways to make their treatments more effective and less embryo loss if they could do these kinds of experiments with federal funding, which they can't. So the answer is there's an awful lot of different pathways for regulation. With the uh, CRISPR technology, there was recently a meeting in Washington, D.C., which was international, where they try to get people from different countries to say, what's going on in your country? Where is it going? Is this, and, and what they came up with was a, uh, a plea for a moratorium on the research until we can make sure that it is going to be safe, both at the mosquito level and at the eventual level of bringing into human beings. 
Thanks, Professor Steinfurt, again, for these wonderful lectures. And for my question, more or less the same, because I would like to you know, know more uh, the actual uh, progress of the genetic enhancements in, in U.S. Uh, because uh, just uh, hearing that, uh, just he heard that yeah, there are lots of regulatories, right, in U.S. Well, it, it isn't physically, it isn't, it isn't medically possible yet, so you can't regulate it until somebody is, has something they want to suggest that they could do. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, they're looking into running a clinical trial in 2017, and that would have to get, I think, FDA approval, right? As well as, I mean, obviously you'd have to get the IRB hospital approval, but before they could run the in trial, would that have to get FDA approval? Do you know? Not FDA, but IRB. IRB, certainly. Not necessarily FDA. So I'm not an expert on the, the different kinds of things, but if you're running a clinical trial, you'd have to get your local IRB. There is no national IRB or statewide even IRB. It's local to the particular hospital and institution. But some things like um, infertility treatment, the FDA has said that comes under our purview. So as I say, I'm not sure how that gets decided. But right now, there is no such thing as genetic enhancement. It's just a possibility. It's important sometimes to think about things before they are sprung on us, right? And that was what, why people wanted to worry about, uh, about cloning, because people were saying, oh, we're, we're going to be doing it tomorrow. And in fact, they still haven't even done it in, uh, in primates. So it kind of lost its allure, became less hot and sexy. Thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, back there is also one. Um, thank you again for the talk. Um, it's more your views also. You meant, you know, one of the man manipulation of gametes and sex cells and embryos. I'm not sure about embryos. It's cryopreservation. So what are your, what's the latest sort of argument or, or your perspective on this? Because people present, um, can... can you know, suspend animation and freeze these cells for, for a long time. So what's the sort of, I was wondering about your views and the current discussions about that. You're talking about egg freezing now or? Yeah, or any sort of crowd. Okay, so we've been doing sperm freezing for a long time and it's safe and it's effective. And then they started with embryo freezing and that it's not as effective as um, fresh embryos in terms of getting a a viable pregnancy, but it does have the advantage that you can, uh, you know, first of all, get your spare embryos and use them for a subsequent pregnancy so the woman doesn't have to go through all of the super ovulatory drugs again. And it also means that if you want to test for infectious disease, you can wait a certain amount of time. The newest thing on the horizon, which is in clinical use now, it's no longer experimental, but it's not terribly successful is egg freezing. And so I think what people need to understand about that is if you are going to be undergoing, say, cancer treatment that might make you infertile and you want to have children, you probably should freeze your eggs. But you should not say, well, I don't have to worry about finding a partner and getting married. I'll just freeze my eggs, and when I'm 50, I'll have kids. Eh, it's not such a good bet. <laughs> Uh, um, <clears throat> I, I'd like to see what you say to this uh, response to your drop in a bucket argument. Uh, I mean, suppose we go to one of the city which has lo lots of crime, I don't know, maybe Mexico City, and actually we might be mugged by some, some guy in, in Mexico City. And that guy said, well, it's only a drop in the bucket because there's a lot of crime happening in the city. What would you say? Presumably you don't want to say, oh, that's okay. Right? No, but if, for example, somebody were to say um, uh, in a city in which there was a great deal of crime, I think what we need to do is X, and X is only going to take care of, you know, 1% of the crime, and 99% of the crime is not being taken care of, we'd say, why would you want to spend resources and time and energy on that? 
So I think what's the, the problem with your analogy is that it's not that uh, one instance of something doesn't matter, but when you're trying to solve a problem, you want to do something that's actually going to address the problem. Right. So I think that if people say the reason why we shouldn't let people be genetically enhanced, assuming it could work, yada yada, is because of social justice, and then you say, and what are you doing about the schools and the housing and all of that? They go, ah, no, nothing. You know, people have a right to uh, buy, go send their kids to private schools, and the rich can get as rich as they want to get, and that's perfectly okay. We don't worry about that. I just don't take them seriously. That's what I say. Anyone else? Well, uh, let me have the last word from here, <laughs> from this stage. Um, I think uh, for the past two months or so, we have had, we have done something that probably no institution in the world has done, and that is to be able to invite two preeminent bioethicists in the world to come out to here and to give 10 plus 1 lectures, <laughs> plus a bonus lectures on bioethics, which is which are actually not only accessible to people who don't know anything about bioethics, but also they are very, very helpful to experts, you know, bioethicists, such as Jonathan and Mike and, and other people. And so I think um, I, I'm extremely grateful, and I'm sure all of you are extremely grateful to both uh, Bonnie and, and Paul. Would, would Bonnie and Paul please come out here? And let's give them a huge round of applause.